Good afternoon or good morning to all of you, participants worldwide, and welcome to this webinar on diagnosis and management of osteoporosis in CKD. My name is Dominique Pierrot. I'm the science manager at IOF, and I'm very glad to be the moderator of this webinar. Before introducing the speakers of the day, I would like to inform you that attendees are automatically muted. I also would like to encourage you to ask questions during the webinar by typing them in the question box of the control panel, and I will voice them to the speakers towards the end of the webinar. And now I have the great pleasure to welcome our two speakers. First, Professor Kasim Javed, who is Associate Professor in Metabolic Bone Disease at Nutfield Center of Orthopedics, Rheumatology and Musculoskeletal Sciences at the University of Oxford in the UK. His main research areas are in the secondary fracture prevention, vitamin D and rare bone disorders. Professor Javed is also the co-chair of the Capture the Fracture Steering Committee, an IOF initiative, but today he is going to bring us his bone expertise in nephrology. And the second speaker of the day is Professor Peter Evenepoel, who is Associate Professor at the Faculty of Medicine and Adjunct Head of Nephrology and Head of Dialysis at the Catholic University of Leuven in Belgium. He is the current chair of the European Renal Osteodystrophy Eurod Working Group, an initiative of the ERA EDTA CKD MBD Working Group, as well as the vice chair of the European Uremic Toxin Working Group. And he has extensively published in the field of uh, kidney diseases. Uh, Professor Javed will start the presentation. Professor Javed, we are listening to you. Uh, thank you very much, Dominique, for the very kind introduction. And of course, I'm not a nephrologist, but I'm giving the humble bone specialist view of nephrology. Um, so these, this is Peter Van Apoel and my disclosures. The key one is that these are our views as authors and from this uh, extraordinary group of specialists who pulled together this uh, uh, commentary on the state of a CKD MBD in the setting of patients at high risk of fracture. Uh, we always thought it's nice to start with some cases, so I'm going to present three cases. This is Thomas, a 68-year-old man with known renal impairment who's had some fractures, has um, what one would consider to be almost normal BMD, but he is extremely overweight and has a range of other comorbidities, as you can see listed here. And uh, as you can see here on the top panel and the bottom panel, this is his uh, journey of Kratten and estimated GFR. Uh, and the question here is, in someone with this sort of history of fracture, what should we do next? The next case is more familiar maybe to the author geriatricians amongst us uh, uh, in our community. This is an 86-year-old lady, Mary, who has a metatarsal fracture a few years ago, didn't raise much concern, and now presents with quite a disabling humeral fracture. Uh, the, she's got some mild cognitive impairment. And here, again, you've got the trajectory of the Kratin and the EGFR. But of note, you can see that because of a low body weight, there is a significant difference between the estimated GFR and the Kratin clearance, highlighting the importance of Kratin clearance, especially if there's low body weight. And finally, we have Joseph. Uh, he's already on anti-osteoporosis therapy. He presented uh, in his mid-80s with an ankle fracture, then a wrist fracture, uh, and because his uh, renal function was already deteriorating, it was thought he would not be for bisphosphonate and started denosumab. And as many of us are now finding, uh, because of the longer duration of uh, therapy, five years later, his renal function has now slipped into what many of us would consider would be uh, CKD4-5. So uh, I think it's time to call in the expert nephrologists. So I'm really glad that we've got such an expert on the webinar today. Peter, could I hand over to you? And you can take us through the diagnosis and management of osteoporosis from your perspective as a nephrologist. Thank you, Kasim. Thank you, Dominique, for introducing. Um, I try to share my slides. Okay. So I do acknowledge that this is a non-nephrology uh, 
people in the audience, so I, I need to introduce a little bit the concept of CKD and BD. Next, I will briefly discuss how we should or we, how we think we should assess uh, bone health in advanced CKD. And then I think I will hand again the microphone to Kasim. He will then discuss the therapeutic approach in patients with advanced CKD presenting with bone fragility or osteoporosis. And then we'll end with some conclusion take home messages to finally discuss again the cases and have hopefully a very lively discussion on this very, uh, I would say sometimes very conflicting topic. So CKD, you all know, it's one of the epidemics of these, these ages. I mean, we know nowadays that up to 10 to 15 percent of all individuals do have some kind of chronic kidney disease. As you can see on this graph, it's mainly a disease of the elderly. So in patients or in individuals above 70 years old, um, up to 35, 40 percent do have some kind of chronic kidney disease. It's also a disease which is still increasing in prevalence. If you just look at two waves of the NHANES data, so 1988, 1994, and a bit later, it's still increasing. But as I said, about 15%, 10 to 15% of the patients, uh, of the individuals nowadays have some kind of chronic kidney disease. Importantly, nowadays we can categorize these chronic kidney disease in five categories according to the estimated GFR from uh, let's say G1 to, to G5, but also we create the aldominuria uh, because both of these, uh, both the, the degree of kidney dysfunction and the degree of aldominuria do uh, have impact on the outcome of the patients. So um, it's something which is very prevalent. And um, so if I can move the slides. It's, it's the CKD, one of the complications of chronic kidney disease is mineral bone disease. It's a prevalent condition. And this, this syndrome was, I mean, this name of this concept was created something like 15 years ago. Um, and it's, it's a combination of lab abnormalities, bone abnormalities, and vascular calcification. And together, all alone, all these items do contribute to cardiovascular disease, fractures, and mortality. So an important aspect of CKD, MDD, is the occurrence of fractures. Uh, what's the pathophysiology of uh, CKD and BD? And then we focus on the on the bone aspect, which is mainly related then to renal osteodystrophy. It's all starting with a declining number of nephrons. So the number of nephrons is declining, and these these nephrons do have to handle with the phosphate load, and this is becoming more and more difficult. And at the end, there is some kind of phosphate retention. This will be sensed by the bone, by the osteoblasts and the osteocytes, in the sense that they will. Uh, be triggered to produce FGF23, fibroblast growth factor 23, which is an important phosphatidic hormone. So it's aiming at, again, getting rid of the, the phosphate. So by increasing the fractional excretion in the kidney of phosphate. On the other hand, also it has impact on the vitamin D metabolism. It will both um, suppress the production and also activate the degradation um, of um, vitamin D. And in the sense that uh, less vitamin D, active vitamin D will be produced. And you know, active vitamin D is also needed for uh, phosphate absorption. So the fractional absorption of phosphate uh, will go down, both helping to maintain phosphate, phosphate levels during the whole course. I mean, until the, the, the stage uh, grade four to five, until that stage, you won't see uh, hyperphosphatemia because all of these, uh, let's say, mechanisms aiming at keeping phosphate in the normal range. But, I mean, this will also go along with a little bit of changes in calcium level, and this will be then sensed by the parotid glands, and this will then trigger the production, the synthesis, and the production and the secretion of PTH. And, of course, we know uh, PTH, uh, high PTH levels is one of the hallmarks of chronic kidney disease and will contribute to renal osteodystrophy. So it's a whole um, wheels that interact and it's just a little bit uh, mimicking what we see in this in this famous cartoon from a, a movie by, by Charlie Chaplin, all wheels interacting. The big question remains, what's the, in, the initiating trigger? And we think at this moment that it's phosphate, phosphate loading, which is the most important trigger of the whole system. So we see patients with advanced CKD with excessively high PTH levels. But despite the high PTH levels, and this is just uh, an overview of several studies looking at the bone histomorphotry data, bone biopsy data. So despite PTH levels being uh, several times 
high as a normal limit, so um, two up to eight, four times the upper norm limit. So despite patients with advanced CKD, and these are mostly patients on dialysis, presenting with very high PTH levels, their bone turnover in many cases is low or normal. So this is pointing to another very important concept, which is different from general population, is that in advanced CKD, there is something like PTH resistance. So PTH doesn't have the, the signaling what we see in, in normal individuals, and that's important to, to remember. So we have renal osteodystrophy, and this is uh, impaired bone quality, but besides impaired bone quality is also impaired bone quantity, and together they contribute to bone fragility, which is then seen in an immense fracture burn in our patients. On the left side, you see the fracture, uh, hip fracture incidence uh, in, uh, in, in a large cohort of individuals, and you can see the fracture risk is increasing according to age. We all know it's also higher in females than in males, but also this is nicely showing there's a graded increase in the hip fracture incidence according to the severity of chronic kidney disease. On the right hand, you see data from DOPS, that's in dialysis patients, and you um, just again to, to show you the hip fracture risk increases according to age, is higher in females and in males, but again, it's fourfold as high in the dialysis population as compared to the general population. So our patients with advanced CKD experience an immense fracture burden, contributing to disability, also increased mortality, and finally also important, important uh, increase in financial uh, burden to the, uh, the socioeconomic system. So it's important that we get, I mean, that we can lower the fracture burden. Of course, the first step is then to assess the bone health in our patients. And that's not easy, we have several tools, several means. First of all, it should include a general assessment. Of course, we need to know what's the kidney function in our patient. We also need to assess the basics of mineral metabolism, and these include a measurement of calcium level, phosphate level, PTH level, and also the vitamin D status. Also, we can have a look at the bone turnover in a way by looking at alkaline phosphatase, and we'll look more in detail on more specific bone biomarkers later on. And also we should have a look at the nutritional status, mainly uh, trying to estimate calcium intake, which sometimes can be very low. And also should have a look at the acid-base status because metabolic acidosis being also an important uh, a frequent complication in advanced CKD is something that is really easy to correct and should also help to maintain the bone health in our patients. In the forthcoming slides, I will briefly discuss other let's say general assessment tools, which include imaging, clinical risk factor scores, bone biomarkers, and bone biopsies. First, DEXA. Up to recently, and the publication in 2017 of the updated KDGO guidelines, we as nephrologists, we thought DEXA is of no value. I mean, it will not predict fracture risk in our patients. But since then, uh, since the, I mean, the, the, the last decade, many publications have been uh, published reporting that indeed also in patients with advanced CKD, DEXA is able to predict fracture risk. And this is a famous study from a Japanese cohort, uh, hemodialysis cohort, where you can see that the AUC for um, uh, BMD, both at the total hip, femoral neck at the radius is um, uh, nice, but it's not excellent, but at least it's helping, it's predicting fractures in these patients as well. And in fact, as good as in the general population. Meanwhile, other studies like this study from OS also again showing the same DEXA BMD is able to predict future fractures, incident fractures in patients with uh, advanced CKD. So this uh, was a major change in the updated KDGO guidelines. So nowadays uh, KDGO is stimulating, it's supporting the use uh, of DEXA BMD in uh, fracture discrimination in fracture uh, prediction. So what kind of skeletal site should we then select uh, with the DEXA machine? Uh, as in general population, we believe that the primary skeletal site should be the lumbar spine and the hip. We could also opt for including the forearm, for example, the radius, uh, because we know that in CKD, uh, high PTH uh, could result in mainly um, uh, cortical bone uh, problems, and therefore we could include also a cortical rich skeletal site, which is, for example, the forearm. But we should be aware that cortical, uh, that the, um, um, uh, the forearm is less reliable. All studies being performed with, with, with uh, drugs, with, in, with um, 
um, it, all the all relied on, on, on the lumbar spine and the hip. So we don't know what's exactly the meaning of the regis BMD. So there should be some caution in using solely uh, regis um, BMD in, in your workup. Also be aware that there are several sources of bias. We are all aware of these, the aortic calcification, which could give you, uh, let's say, a falsely positive high uh, BMD at the anterior posterior lumbar spine um, images. Um, this is a little bit uh, overemphasized according to recent data we analyzed, but still, this is something we should keep in mind. Also, other uh, problems with the, um, the vertebra, like scoliosis, degenerative diseases, should be accounted for and could give you false high um, um, low um, lumbar spine DEXA data. So you should be aware of that. With regard to the wages, uh, besides the more important variability, also we should always account for the presence of an arteriovenous fistula in patients on dialysis. Uh, this will go along with a falsely low um, DEXA BMD result at the site with the functional fistula as you can see in on the uh, graph on the right side hand. Also important to, to acknowledge is that, that the DEXAS can inform you on bone volume and mineralization, but it will not give you any information on the um, underlying renal osteodystrophy subtype. So as shown in this nice cartoon, uh, the same BMD 1.25 grams per square centimeter it can be seen with a normal bone volume, a patient with frank osteoporosis, a patient with osteomalacia, and also a patient with uh, frank hyperparathyroidism. So be aware of this. That's a nice for bone volume mineralization, but will not inform you un on the underlying uh, you know, osteodystrophy. Important also to emphasize that we do believe that this is underused, the assessment of the vertebral fractures by means of, you could do it by means of lateral DEXA, but also by just plain uh, radio uh, graph uh, images. And we do believe that as, uh, um, um, is, is, uh, for example, the, the International Society of Clinical Densitometry guidelines do advocate to, to assess the, um, the vertebra fracture uh, by means of, of different tools when t score is below uh, minus one or in case of one of the following is present and you can see it on this slide. So just to emphasize that, that vertebral fracture assessment is something which is underused. It's very common uh, in, in patients with, um, with CKD as regional population, especially in the elderly. Also, it could be at the same time give you some uh, insights in the calcification of the aorta um, and the extent of calcification of, and as such, it can help in, in overall uh, risk um, uh, assessment, uh, ask a risk assessment in your patients. So that's something you get in, which, which is important uh, in, in addition to just having insight in the, uh, the presence of uh, fractures, also to have insight in the extent of vascular calcification. Besides uh, imaging, also clinical risk scores could be of help. And, and we know there are several risk scores that are used in, in clinical practice. The most, let's say, widespread uh, risk uh, score is the one being developed by uh, Sheffield, the FLAC score. And it's uh, important to, to emphasize, and this is based on some uh, recent publications, that these FLAC scores that you calculate, um, they are not doing that bad. I mean, they both overestimate and underestimate the real risk, but they can give you some kind of a rough uh, estimate of the factor risk, the 10-year factor risk in your patient. So we, we're still waiting for, for further arithmetic adjustments of the FRAX course um, with knowledge of advanced CKD. But in the meantime, and not having this data, I think we, we can use the FRAX score uh, as it is um, now uh, available um, in, in most, most centers. I mean, it's still available on the internet. OK, next is bone biomarkers. Um, there are many bone biomarkers. And just to uh, summarize all the evidence in one slide, we do believe that they can be of help in prognostication, both to predict factors, but also to predict bone loss, that the performance is moderate to good. Um, also in, in defining which is the optimal treatment, should we go for anti-absorptive agents or for, bis, uh, for um, anabolic agents, they can be of help. 
And also recent data indicate that, the, that these bone biomarkers do have a, a high negative predictive value. So they can help you to exclude, for example, low bone turnover disease or exclude uh, high bone turnover disease. But the positive predictive value, so if you want really to confirm a disease state, then that's, that's uh, of less use. Uh, next is the, um, the, the fact of the bone biopsy. And I try to get it rid of the. The bone biopsy is, is said to be the gold standard. And bone biopsy can nowadays be performed in the outpatient setting with some local anesthesia and light sedation. We do it uh, common in our patients. We're using not the big body needles, but the small um, Yamashidi type needles with uh, 3.8 millimeter inner diameter. So, seven gauge is sufficient uh, for obtaining material which can be read by the pathologist. And so then after some time, and this is a little bit of a problem, the time between the, the procedure and the, the diagnosis is sometimes long and it's not really a clinical uh, uh, a good thing to, to have to wait so long for, for a result of a, of a bone biopsy, that, that's what it is. But at least um, we, we can perform it and sometimes it's, which can be of help in some patients to perform a bone biopsy. But there is, of course, I mean, it's, it's something that's not everywhere available. Um, it, it remains still an invasive laborious procedure. Um, the um, histopathological expertise is, is vanishing. I mean, uh, at least we are very lucky in Belgium that we have a, a very famous lab in Antwerp who is reading the bone biopsies. But I mean, elsewhere in, in different countries, it's not that easily available. Uh, still, we are missing the link with, with bone outcomes between bone histomorphology and bone outcomes. Um, um, there is some 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 uh, opportunities. I mean, we, we can easily move from the big needles, the body needles, to the small needles, and this, of course, goes along with uh, less morbidity for the patient, so the less lower threshold to perform this procedure. So I think this is something we don't we we should do more often, awaiting uh, additional, let's say, help from from biomarkers and so on. Okay, let's move in to the therapeutic approach. I do understand it's all in a nutshell, but you, you can find everything more in details in, in the publication we recently uh, uh, published in NDT. So moving to the therapeutic um, approach in patients with advanced CKD, it should be, in general, we can see that up to stage three, we can or we should treat our patients as in general population. Uh, these patients with this degree of kidney disease were included in the large registration trials and, and again they showed the same kind of efficacy, the same safety profiles is as individuals without any degree of kidney disease. With patients with more advanced CKD and as we define CKD grade 4 to grade 5b then it's more problematic uh, and there is at least um, we, we see many of these patients in our clinic and they, were, they are referred because of a fracture because they are referred because uh, someone did a DEXA scan and, and uh, they demonstrated a low T-score. And then they are referred to a nephrologist or to, to bone heads. And then there's a big question mark, what to do next? And, and, and this, this, I mean, this, this big question mark is related to the lack of knowledge of the underlying pathophysiology. We don't know what's really going on in the bone of patients with advanced CKD. There's certainly lack of evidence coming from randomized controlled trials. Uh, in, in the past, all those patients with advanced CKD were excluded from, from the registration trials. So we don't have really good, nice data on, on the efficacy and safety in patients with advanced CKD. And finally, uh, even more than general population, uh, nephrologists and boneheads do fear complications, uh, osteonecrosis of the jaw, uh, the atypical fractures, and so on. It's something that they all fear even more in patients with advanced CKD. And this all results in what we call renal nihilism. We just sit back and relax. We, do no, we, we don't do nothing. But as I said, also doing nothing is a treatment option and not always the best treatment option. So sometimes we probably do better something. Um, so the big, the, the big challenge is that we should move from, from nihilism to pragmatism. That, that's, that's an important take home message. And there's several being um, pragmatic approaches being published over the years in, in uh, nice journals. I mean, this is just, just one of them also. I mean, when you face a patient with CKD presenting with osteoporosis, but by definition also, certainly when it's advanced CKD with some degree of middle and bone disease, uh, 
first thing you should do is, of course, control uh, the metabolic disturbances in the sense of controlling metabolic acidosis, look for the nutritional status, and so on, I, I just discussed. But the first thing besides is you should look for the turnover status in your patient. And of course, there's already a big challenge. What's the turnover in your patient? Is it low, normal, or high? Uh, you can use bone turnover markers, and if these bone turnover markers, uh, together with PTH, doesn't inform you that well, you could consider to perform a bone biopsy to assess by the gold standard the bone turnover. Once you have defined or estimated the bone turnover and it turns out to be high, then of course the first thing should be to suppress PTH. You can use calcimimetics, you can use, you can refer to a surgeon when there's indication for a paratoidectomy, you can increase active vitamin D or you uh, put um, lobby or put all your energy in controlling the first trigger, which is the phosphate. So you should uh, aim for better phosphate control. If on the other hand, your turnover seems to be low, then the first um, thing you should do is try to increase the PTH. And this, I mean, tools are less available, but probably you could have a look at the calcium load. Are you not overloading your patient with calcium via the calcium containing phosphate binders, for example, or via the calcium dialysate? Uh, you could lower the dose of the calcium mimetic and so on. So you, you try to, to, the therapeutic action is to, to normalize the, um, the bone turnover. It's still patients keeps on having low bone mineral density and, and fracture or fracture incidence is high. Then of course, in addition, you should go for lifestyle modification and also um, uh, consider some uh, pharmacological therapy. Lifestyle modification is often forgotten, but it's really very important. So you should ascertain uh, sufficient calcium intake. And again, CKD patients often do get protein restriction and protein is an important source of calcium. So it's very nice if you would try to estimate the calcium intake in your patient and, and at least up titrate it towards one 1.5 gram elemental calcium uh, intake per day. And again, that will be many patients who will need some calcium supplements. Also, you should check the vitamin D status and consider supplements when it's uh, below 30 nanograms per ml. Uh, also have, I mean, at least we should more pay attention to physical activity, like, like the, the bed bike, for example, is something that could be of help in uh, increasing bone mineral density and also uh, uh, decreasing the fall risk, for example. That's also something which is important, general measures to uh, decrease the uh, fracture incidence. But when this, I mean, besides this, of course, there's other uh, therapeutical approaches which include uh, drug therapy. And I think uh, Kasim will now discuss more in detail what kind of drugs we have available and what's the evidence in patients with advanced CKD. So I will hand it over again to Kasim. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Peter. That was uh, beautiful. So much information in, in such a short time. Fantastic. So I've got the relatively easy task of just going through the drugs that we we have uh, in this context. They're nicely summarised in in the in the consensus statement uh, that Peter led. Um, so um, so the first line one that we think of are the anti-resorptives and the classic are the bisphosphonates, and we know a lot about how they're managed uh, in both in terms of skeletal responses, their effect on the kidney. Uh, and uh, how they're actually metabolized and flow through the kidney. There's a really nice review uh, by, by Miller uh, in 2011. But we have to remember that CKDMD bone is different from normal bone. There's uh, the uremic lone bone turnover state that Peter mentioned. There's a high turnover state with hyperparathyroidism. The importance of PTH resistance. Don't forget osteomalacia is actually quite, can be quite common in this group. And the, and the problems with accumulation of, of bisphosphonate. Um, when you look at the initial studies, this is a, a nice paper that brought together data from nine registration trials with residronate um, uh, using the daily dose and picked out people who took part in these large randomized control trials with a creatinine clearance of less than 30. And you can see here that the um, in, the, in the white bars, the uh, Residronate had a much lower risk of a new morphometric vertebral fractures in the placebo arm in those with severe uh, 
moderate and mild uh, renal impairment, which is reassuring. But uh, these are healthy people taking part in trials and they all had a normal PTH. So really not representative of the patients that we see in the cases I've brought up. So if you look at the hemodialysis population, far fewer studies. Uh, this is the one looking at uh, alendronate um, uh, and um, with some strict exclusion criteria. So they suited people with frank secondary hyperparathyroidism and poor functional status. Uh, and you can see um, the bone turnover markers uh, changes were, were modest and there was no actual change in bone mineral density. But the real restriction we face is regulatory. So uh, this is the SMPC uh, for the different uh, bisphosphonates and uh, what's a precaution and what's a straightforward contraindication. Uh, and when you look back, there's lots of reasons for this. A lot of it is due to lack of experience, uh, but the red lines are, are really for zeladronate and, and residerate. Uh, and I just want to highlight a, you a recent study that was published by uh, Dr. Preto Alhambra's group from Oxford, which I was lucky to be part of. Uh, and this used um, a quite a nice study bringing together information from uh, UK primary care records and Catalonia. So lots of validation. And they took a simple approach. They looked at everyone in the primary care data set who had uh, modest renal impairment, so you know CKD 3B or below, and then looked to see who got bisphosphonates and who didn't. And you end up with uh, just under 4,000 incident bisphosphonate users and just under 15,500 non-users. And then you use a standard, or for me non-standard, but for them very standard, statistical techniques to match them and this shows the effect of propensity matching on a number of covariates. And what they were able to show was a modest increased risk of CKD progression that was exaggerated in those with a previous uh, fracture history, the so positive fracture history, uh, 36% uh, increase. And you know, it's salient that their conclusion was that our findings should be considered before prescribing bisphosphonates to people in moderate to severe CKD, because what we don't want to do is actually worsen the CKD with our interventions uh, while, while at the same time we're trying to reduce fracture risk. So the other real anti-resort we want to spend a little bit more time on is uh, denosumab, and here we have the problem with hypocalcemia. Uh, there's been a number of uh, national alerts in the UK uh, around the risk of severe life-threatening hypocalcemia in those with severe uh, kidney impairment or on dialysis. Nevertheless, uh, some uh, re uh, researchers have put together studies where they've uh, looked at uh, hemodialysis patients and the impact of denosumab in this group. So, you know, small series, 48 uh, dialysis patients um, with low bone mass, um, reasonable PTHs, up to 25 picomoles per litre, um, uh, not hypocalcemic and no severe other comorbidities. 50% were already on sinicalcid. And here they compared 60 milligrams of denosumab with monthly IV alendronate, preparation we're not familiar with in the UK, uh, over a year. And um, they all had supplements with activated vitamin D and calcium. And you can see with Adenosumab a significant improvement in anti in uh, bone resorption with a reduction in TRAP uh, 5B, but also a suppression of P1 and P. And in both arms, there was an increase in lumbar spine BMD and really not much going on with femoral neck bone density uh, over time. An outcome they were looking at was coronary calcification vascular function, and there was no uh, evidence of this, because there's a real push to see if we can tie the two processes together, the process of fracture reduction and vascular risk would be the sort of the, um, uh, the, the ultimate aim for anything we do. But real concern here was, uh, despite the uh, supplementation of activated vitamin D and uh, calcium lactate, there was one case of grade four hypocalcemia. So that's described as life-threatening and requiring urgent intervention. Just highlighting that even in this control trial setting, you have to be very aware that uh, high, severe hypercalcemia can exist. Um, and, and that was really it until um, I was pointed to this paper, a very small study again, uh, a convenient sample. So dialysis patients and contemporary uh, non-DMAB controls who didn't want to take part in the study. Um, they had secondary hyperparathyroidism and they were given a single dose of denosumab uh, and they just wanted to 
really look at the coronary calcification from a CT perspective. And here uh, we can see the bone density changes. Um, so there was an increase in bone density before and after the denosovum arm that wasn't really seen in the control arm. And remember, the control arm wasn't randomized. It was a convenience control sample. And the differences in bone density were also seen at the spine, whereas no difference was seen in the control. Forward provokingly, um, the increase in calcification score was only seen in the control arm, and there was a suggestion of a reduction in the denosumab arm, which sort of raised the opportunity for uh, potent anti-resorptives to reduce coronary calcification. And a, a picture, uh, Kevin Poole told me, said, you know, tells the story of a thousand words. This is a dramatic picture where they looked at digital calcification scores before and six months after the denosumab in the hand. So clearly just a case, um, and we really need to look at this more carefully, but it does again highlight the potential for linking cardiovascular with bone and getting out now. What about safety? Again, a very high proportion, despite this quite robust calcium supplementation, activating vitamin D and altering the calcium diacylate, eight out of 21 had a calcium of less than two. There were no symptomatic cases of hypercalcemia. Again, highlighting that, you know, denosumab and the uh, dialysis patient is still a research area or a very careful uh, control study. Uh, what about anabolics? It seems kind of counterintuitive. Peter's just told us that actually secondary hyperparathyroidism and PDH resistance is quite important. But there is a potential role in this adynamic bone disease. Um, so uh, especially post-parathyroidectomy or in patients with diabetes. Uh, and we know that um, in the, with renal impairment, you do get a longer half-life uh, with, with teriparatide uh, compared uh, with those with normal renal function from a small phase one study. So there's two ways we can, we can look at this. So this is a post-marketing study of all women on teriparatide for which a very small proportion also had renal impairment, most secondary prevention you'd expect, and there's a modest increase in P1MP and, and a modest increase in bone density, but again, no control data. Um, this rather remarkable study looked at 10 uh, patients with uh, hemodialysis who had very low PTH levels, so PTH less than six, which is really unusual in this population, so really fitting, as Peter described, the uh, adynamic um, group, compared with five untreated patients. So not really a controlled study in that, in that respect. And here you can see there was a there was an increase in bone density uh, at the lumbar spine, uh, and there may have been a sort of prevention of loss of the femoral neck. But again, you know, tiny study, not really well controlled. Um, here are the bone marker changes um, uh, uh, with the increases in uh, in trap uh, and uh, uh, bone alkaline phosphatase. Um, uh, and you can see what this really shows, actually, there was a response. The, the, the renal um, physiology was still responsive to PTH, which is, which is kind of encouraging. The kind of discouraging thing was the high rate of discontinuation. Hypotension, which we know is a recognized complication of teriparatide therapy, was really problematic in this group. Uh, and in this study, four out of 10 people had to discontinue because of hypertension malaise. And in another study, uh, uh, almost half had to discontinue many because of hypertension. So it seems to be a tolerability issue. Just closing out with the anabolics, um, this is a nice study where a case report, so much other we can learn, 51-year-old lady with persistent hypercalcemia, despite near total parathyroidectomy, PTH level was undetectable, proven biopsy, uh, adenoid bone disease. And on top line, you can see her, her calcium levels. Um, uh, and um, they gave her teriparatide and her calcium levels went down. Uh, they took her off teriparatide, calcium level went back up, and she's now on daily, daily teriparatide. So for hypercalcemia of dynamic bone disease, a very uh, well, in the bone clinic, we don't see this, uh, there may be a role for anabolics. What about the new anabolic, romazosumab? Well, there's only one uh, study I could find, on, uh, not published, it's on the Amgen clinical study site. It's a single phase one study uh, of uh, eight patients, CKD4, eight dialysis, and eight healthy. And, um, you know, you, we could see even in CKD4 and dialysis, there was still an anabolic response 
um, to uh, romazosumab with a, a reduction in resorption markers. Um, obviously, this wasn't as uh, as big as we saw in the in the um, uh, in the health population, but but it was there. Uh, hypotension, hypo, hypocalcemia, sorry, was common in 20%, um, and there was one hospitalisation. Um, there was an increase in hyperparathyroidism, uh, most marked in Dallas population, but also a reduction in phosphate. But the real issue for using romazosumab is the um, cardiovascular risk, and it's listed here as a really important risk factor when you're addressing the risk balance ratio. So um, taking all together, Peter and the rest of the consensus group uh, have put together this nice algorithm to give the probatic uh, approach to dealing with uh, CKD uh, uh, in the presence of patients at high fracture risk. So what happens if we apply it to the three cases I introduced you to? So here's Thomas with known progressive renal impairment. And you know, he uh, he had a further workup, he was found to have a low vitamin D level. Um, and just to highlight, you know, there are risks for replacing vitamin D and that you can really push the serum phosphate a lot higher. Uh, and you just need to let the nephrologist know that you're going to be replacing it so they can be prepared for it. And you know, it's probably best to go with low dose rather than high dose replacement. Um, his DEXA was actually found to be inappropriately normal because of his um, high body weight. So do be aware that you know, if someone's got a body mass of 139 kilograms, you have to take their DEXA readings with a pinch of salt. And the trajectory of his renal function really made us focus, as Peter's mentioned, on CKDMD optimization. So making sure he's got enough calcium and replacing his vitamin D. What about Mary, who's just got, you know, not really known to renal and has got quite bad uh, kidney function? So we actually called her in, uh, we put her into the clinic, and she actually had quite significant height loss and had three vertebral fractures. So she's got a, uh, a wrist fracture, um, uh, a metatarsal fracture, and now has got uh, three vertebral fractures. Um, her creatinine is in stable or improving over quite a long period of time. Uh, the phosphate, vitamin D, and calcium are normal, and her PTH is low. So she could be a candidate for uh, bone therapy. So uh, we took the approach of supplementing her calcium vitamin D, making sure she's happy taking a daily dose, and then discussing with her the risk benefits of denosumab uh, with a two-week post-dose serum calcium. And uh, that's ongoing. And then finally, the patient who's already on denosumab, who then develops renal impairment. Here it's a different picture. Um, so the patients on denosumab, we know about the uh, off effect of stopping denosumab. So we had a blip in his calcium in 2016. And when he was reassessed, it was found that he wasn't taking his supplements. So he made it clear that he had to take his supplements and he's now on BD. But whilst on supplements, as his kidney function has got worse, he's now getting hypercalcemia uh, post uh, denosumab uh, two weeks after with the dosing. Um, we've got a, a straightforward protocol. We tend to exclude PPIs because they can cause hypercalcemia through magnesium deficiency. We make sure the vitamin D is optimized and taking the supplements. And then we start um, alpha calcidol uh, daily till the calcium is normal, usually required for um, one or two weeks and then stop it. And then we discuss after this acute phase, what six months before the next injection, the risks and benefits of stopping denosumab uh, versus just giving a, a pre-dose of alpha calcidol for the, before the next injection to sort of provide some short-term cover um, during the period of potential highest risk for hypocalcemia. So that's what we've done, and that's our perspective of what we do in, in our unit. And hopefully, that's generated at least a thousand questions. <laughs> so, uh, take home messages. I'm actually going to hand this over to Peter because he, I mean, although a paper has got lots of authors, he actually led the consensus statement for a tremendous amount of work in. Uh, so, Peter, do you want to close us out, and I'll advance the slides for you? If you just unmute yourself. I think you're muted, Peter. Thank you, Kasim, for also very nice overview and, and also some practical insights in, in concrete cases, which also makes it very interesting. And uh, because at the end, we need to translate all the evidence to, to practice. And that's sometimes the most difficult task, how to translate everything in, 
in, in how to, to act in the patients sitting in front of you. So um, I hope you, you're all now convinced that the fractures is something which is a real challenge uh, in advanced CKD, uh, not at the least because of the high mobility and mortality. And of course, we always need to balance risks of not treating versus treatment. That's something, I mean, if you could take this home, that, that would be great. And in, in uh, assessing a patient, I mean, we, we should try to integrate risk factors, uh, imaging, biomarkers. And if you don't be successful, I mean, if you're still within the gray zone, then probably the lucky uh, that's having access to, to, to bone biopsy and, and histomorphy can then proceed with a bone biopsy. But normally, I mean, the integration of risk factors, imaging techniques and biomarkers should be sufficient to, to have an overall view on what's going on in your patients and also making the good, uh, let's say, uh, uh, therapeutic um, decisions. Treatment should be pragmatic, uh, multi-leveled, multidisciplinary. I mean, integrating uh, nephrologists, uh, but also uh, bone heads. Uh, I mean, this kind of Outpatient clinics is the best if you could would be able to discuss difficult cases in the in a, in a whole team. Uh, first of all, we should focus, and there's of course the view of the nephrologist, uh, focus in optimizing the, the CKD MBD stages. Uh, um, and again, you should remember that normalization of PTH PTH is not needed. We have this PTH resistance in our patients, so you should allow for the PTH level which is four or five times the upper normal limit. Uh, beware of the calcium and, 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 and certainly the deficient calcium intake. So assess calcium intake and, and uh, provide sufficient calcium to, to your patient. Uh, also vitamin D should always be assessed and supplemented when needed. And then case by case risk benefit discussion of different anti-osteoporosis medications is, is needed. And, and uh, I mean, there's a lot of discussion going on on, on, on what's the best. I mean, we, we should, and get rid of the of the complete, I will I would say the, the monosynaptic approach that, that CKD equals no antiresorptive therapy. I mean, I think in some of our patients, antiresorptive agents certainly can be of help, can help to mitigate the, the fracture risk uh, in making the choice between bisphosphonate and antiresorptive agents. I mean, it's it's something you have to, you have to take into account many uh, issues like like the renal risk, but also the risk of hypercalcemia. At the end, you need to discuss all this with your patient um, and um, have a good uh, cost-benefit, uh, um, let's say, estimation. So, I mean, there is there is something. I mean, this kind of discussions and this kind of presentations uh, that uh, certainly is only the beginning. We we would like to refer you to this to this paper, which is freely accessible on uh, on NDT, and Dominic will send you the link uh, tomorrow. Um, but still, there's a problem that will be not be solved by this webinar. I mean, this is an ongoing problem. I think it's will becoming more and more. It will become worse. I will see more and more patients with advanced CKD with osteoporosis and fractures. Uh, so we need more research. Um, certainly, if you have questions, please contact us. I mean, I think there's certainly many things we can do, uh, not at least uh, uh, to start initiate, for example, registries where we uh, um, get, I mean, that we will list all patients who are getting the nosumab and see what are the, uh, the, 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 the complications so we can learn from these this, uh, trajectories in order to, to avoid uh, complications. So there's much we have to be learned, much to have to be uh, done in the future, so we need your help. And with this, I would like again thank the IF for giving us the opportunity. And I hope, as, as Kasim announced in the beginning, we have a lively discussion because uh, now it's up to you to ask the, let's say, the very uh, difficult questions. There are certainly many of them. Thank, Thank you. you very Thank you very much, Professors Javed and Evan Paul, for this beautiful and very comprehensive presentation illustrated with clinical cases and for covering a topic that stimulates many questions. Uh, I'm sure that your talk was greatly appreciated by our audience and now I would like to move on to questions as we have received many of them during the presentation. Maybe uh, I will start with some question uh, regarding uh, bone markers. Um, so maybe I will Joyce, just voice you a few questions that which are quite related. So one question is uh, which uh, bone turnover or marker do you use in CKD patients? Another one is uh, 
um, uh, is it is somebody is mentioning that uh, Dr. Ban, sorry, is mentioning that it's difficult to assess serum CTX as it is high. Uh, so he's asking whether if you are recommended to use uh, uh, BSAP, uh, phosphate as alkaline. Um, somebody else, uh, let me find, ah, Dr. Paskins is asking uh, if uh, P1 and P is still re reliable in uh, patients with CKD at stage four and five. So I if think I, this question if I, I... If I just may, may start, it seems so. I mean, yes, excellent I... questions, of course. I mean, uh, as I said, we, we touched everything very briefly in a condensed way, so there's many other things to be to be told. Bone biomarkers, certainly, I think, I think they will be increasingly important. And of course, I do know that in the osteoporosis world, I mean, it's all CPX and P1 and P, which is being considered, uh, let's say, the gold standard for us as biomarker. But of course, as nephrologists, we're a little bit concerned about these biomarkers because they are retained in renal failure. So both the total P1 and P and CTX are massively retained in, in kidney failure. And when you're dealing with a patient with a variable kidney function, it's very hard to get, let's say, uh, the feeling on what, what's high, what's low. I mean, you have always to consider the kidney function. So we as nephrologists, we prefer uh, bone biomarkers which are not retained by renal failure. And then we're talking about bone-specific alkaline phosphatase. We are talking about trimeric uh, P1 and P, and we're also talking about uh, TREP 5B, uh, which are the most, um, uh, let's say, studied so far. Uh, I do know that these biomarkers are not everywhere available, but uh, they are at least uh, on platforms available in, in many laboratories, and, and probably they will become more widespreadly available in the future. But these are the ones we as nephrologists prefer. Kasim, you, yeah. you agree? Yeah. I agree, and I, and I think we have to use the bone markers with all the other information. So, what's the level of the PTH? What's the level of the alkaline phosphatase total? What's the level of the 25-hydroxy uh, vitamin D? It's not one magic bullet. It's it's actually it it does tire out the juniors because they have to think a lot. But you have to look at all the evidence in front of you, and just and, don't and forget and someone who's recently had a fracture. You will get a spike in bone markers. So, in yeah, the, yeah, in yeah, the recent fracture setting, it's really not helpful. But uh, use the bone markers, tenno markers, but don't throw away the PTH, the vitamin D, and the alphas. That will give you a lot of information. And also, very important message is what what Kedigo is is trying to teach us all the time. It's don't look at a single value, but look at, at trends. Trends. Yeah. Look at. I mean, go in the between the files. Look for. I mean, if you don't have every month bone alkaline phosphatase, then just look at the total alkaline phosphatase. You will find several data about it, and it gives you inform you on on the let's say evolution. Because it's all taking time, and we need we don't need to treat single values. We need to treat uh, trends. So if the PTH is an upward trend, that's something. It's time to 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 act. If the alkaline phosphatase is is uh, above the upper normal limit and it's still increasing, then it's probably um, evolving towards high bone turnover, and and resorptive agents or even better CKD and BD control is what you should do. And that trend is really important when you look at the renal function as well. I mean, if you stand back. Uh, the first case, Thomas, his kidney function was just getting progressively worse. And if we were having a hard time choosing now, we would be having a really hard time in six months' time. So, you know, we look at the renal trend as well. Uh, and that's a very good point, Peter. Okay, thank you, both of you. Uh, I have a, a question uh, by Dr. Otum, who is asking, what is the recommended daily dose of calcium and vitamin D in CKD patients? Shall I start? Yes. I mean, vitamin D, I mean, we, it's, it's, there's a whole discussion going on. I mean, nowadays it's more like it's, it's level based. So we, we are in the policy of, of uh, measuring vitamin D levels, um, let's say twice a year, and then accordingly uh, adopt a dose of, of the, um, the uh, holocalcifidol. I mean, it's, uh, the, I mean, this is the most commonly used um, nutritional vitamin D in Europe, at least. Uh, so it's it's mainly driven by the the levels um, that we measure uh, vitamin D. So a, a dose, uh, and if you don't do it, I mean, I would say 25,000 units every two weeks is something which is sufficient in most um, patients. But but again, we're using the the guided by by the by the by the levels. 
calcium uh, intake, uh, as, as emphasized, is something which has been neglected, and at least nephrologists are also very reluctant to, to, to prescribe calcium because we all see our patients calcifying, and we, we, we have the very simplistic thought that the more calcium you give your patient, the more they will calcify. I'm a little bit, um, I don't think it's that, that, that easy, that simple. It's more, I think, inflammation and so on, which is much more important than just the calcium. Uh, but but uh, calcium intake is rather low, uh, at least in Belgium. It's better in, in Switzerland because cheese intake is, I mean, they have very nice cheese. I don't know in the UK if you have good cheese or if you have um, milk consumers. I mean, it's, it depends on your diet of your patient, but, but at least you, you should take, I mean, it's, it's a small survey. Uh, there's uh, easy questionnaires available to estimate calcium intake. And you, you should provide calcium preferentially to the diet up to 1.5. Uh, gram of elemental calcium, so that that's something, and it's that that's that's um, not. I mean that that's uh, a bunch of calcium. Yeah, I, mean, I, I don't know if, if you if you and your patients do routinely uh, estimate calcium intake, can you act upon? Yeah, so I mean the problem with the calcium is the dairy is often the first thing that knocks off with the protein restriction in CKD four and five, so we do aim for at least seven hundred. Especially if you're going in with a potent anti-resorptive, you've got to make sure they've got enough calcium on board. So yeah, over a yeah. gram. And there is that concern about vascular calcification, also from the patient side, because they might have heard something. So it is explaining to them that being calcium deficient is bad. We're just trying mm -hmm. to bring you to normal rather than give you too much. Yeah, it's always Foucault's pendulum. We have been teached to, to avoid, I mean, we have been... I mean, if I go back 20 years ago, we were overloading our patients with calcium. And I mean, of course, then that, that's bad, but then it's completely the other side and now we're giving too, too, too low calcium, too less. I mean, so it's in between always, it's the best. Okay, thank you. Now we will move to some questions regarding treatments. Uh, we have received many, so I will start with one from Dr. Coquille. Uh, she's asking whether there are any evidence uh, for reduced doses of oral bisphosphonates? Uh, and for, not to my knowledge, and it probably treats the doctor more than the patient. <laughs> be cheeky. I think it's a real problem with reduced dose. So that when I was training, you know, giving the residronate every fortnight was thought to be better. I mean, there is evidence that it is due to the peak dose, uh, um, or the, uh, but actually, um, it, you just you're just drifting further and further away from the situation at hand in terms of the evidence base and we're already as peter and i said when we introduced it we're already really far away from the evidence so we've got trials of 40 people and i think um alternate day alternate week bisphosphonate sounds reasonable but actually it needs to be formally tested and and the current data we have so far is that you know there is a safety signal with oral bisphosphonates making CKD worse, which is the last thing you want to do from someone who's in CKD4 to push them into CKD5. So I'm, I'm, I'm not a supporter, but that's my personal view. No, it's the same with me. I really don't have any data. And you, some nephrologists at least do it uh, for some reason because they believe it's better, but it's not supported by any data. It's just a, it's just a belief. Um, no, I mean, I will also go for the, for the normal doses. Um, um, in, in patients, but, but as I said, I mean, in, in, in taking into account, the, the, I mean, the choice, um, bisphosphonate uh, versus the, the nosumab, I mean, kidney function is, of course, an important, um, it's an important thing to, to consider. And, and the BRISC study, at least, points to some kind, still some kind of safety uh, signal, um, which, which certainly is, is important. Yeah, at, at the least you would like to do is to, to further, to, to accentuate the, 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 the kidney progression. And you're quite right, Peter. But obviously, clearly, if someone's already on dialysis, then you know. They, yeah, they've, on dialysis, yeah. I wouldn't, of course, so, we, we all. I mean, as an apology, we always we want to keep the residual renal function as high as possible because this is really also related to to um, yeah. to, to outcome. Uh, in, in, I mean, it's, even if your if your urine uh, output is is less than 100 ml per day, this is still contributing to 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 outcome. So. It, to that extent, I'm, I'm still, I mean, even on dialysis, please have an eye on the residual renal function. Yeah. Okay. I'm learning loads. <laughs> Thank you. 
Uh, another question from Dr. Pazianeas is asking what is your take on the proposed calcium together with phosphorus retention in the development of CKD MBD and the use of intermittent PTH administration in the management of this disease beyond adenomic bone disease. He is the, the lead author of a paper uh, published in GBMR. So I suppose. Hi, Michael. Good to see you here from you. I, I expected a complicated question. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah, Cassine, you can start then. <laughs> yeah, so the calcium phosphate product is really Im Im important. And Peter and I discussed this is really rare condition called calciphylaxis, which which I've seen a case of and sort of put me off. Um, I've I've described the um, the sort of evidence we have for intermittent PTH. I think it's, um, uh, you know, maybe giving it even less frequently is an option. But the the only flag that I, I, I tried to communicate was the tolerability. Uh, and if you're giving an even bigger dose intermittently, I could only predict the hypotension will be worse and the patients just won't tolerate it. Um, I mean, uh, uh, CKDMD patients put up with a lot of side effects. I've got great respect for them. Uh, they put up with a lot, uh, and but I don't want to add to their falls risk with hypotension. Yeah, um, Peter, right. you want to take the calcium phosphate because I'm not an expert in that area. The point is, I, I didn't get the, the. I mean, calcium phosphate uh, could product. Be, uh, the, the product. Think you, yeah, so you 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 times the two and you don't exceed the threshold. Yeah, yeah. I mean, as as a risk factor for 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 calcification, right? I mean. Um, the calcium phosphate but is a little bit like um, um, not any more popular in, in nephrology. I mean, um, it's 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 it has been said always to be an important predictor of, of calcification, but now we more look at calcium phosphate separately. Um, of course, patients with hypercalcemia, at least in an advanced CKD, with hypercalcemia and high phosphate level, the ones that that, that always have the highest risk of of uh, progressing uh, of progressive vascular calcification. But then the then the intermittent PTH, how this could then have an impact on the calcification? I don't know. I mean, at, at least we as nephrologists, we, we pay much attention in maintaining phosphate in the normal range. I mean, because this is, this is I mean, we're all convinced this is um, probably the, the worst, I mean, among all the, the, the biomarkers or the, or the, uh, the factors being involved in vascular calcification. Um, but, but PTH, of course, I mean, on the one hand, at least in advanced CKD, it, it could increase the, the, the phosphatulia because it's a phosphatulic hormone. Yeah. On the other hand, it can it can have impact on the bone and increase the, the phosphate release from the bone. So at the end, it's hard to predict what will be the outcome on, on phosphate. Um, but I don't know whether this is the answer to your question. I, I have to admit. Michael will no doubt email me. <laughs> yeah, certainly. Welcome. Thank you. Uh... Now, uh, another question related to uh, denosumab by Dr. Ali. Can denosumab accelerate, accelerate deterioration in renal function if it is used in patients with an EGR over 45? EG, EGFR, sorry. No. No, so at least up to, up to I mean, there's nice data up to CKD stage four, I mean, of the freedom study, post hoc analysis, and then as Kasim alluded to, there's some studies in advanced CKD, mainly on dialysis, uh, not that many in, in really CKD state 4 5. But there's no reason to assume there is a, a renal risk of, of, of denosumab. No. There is also studies performed post transplantation, and they didn't see any renal signal, only uh, some kind of um, uh, infection risk, which, which was a little bit uh, higher in the denosumab patients. I don't know. Uh, have any Peter, what do you think of? Would it, yeah, I mean, that infection risk has caused a lot of nephrologists to avoid using denosumab. And so really, uh, we weren't, I mean, in the, the bone community, of course, there was a, uh, there was a, a signal for, you know, s skin infections and specific skin infections. But, you know, we've taken much reassurance from the cancer studies, which have used really high doses of denosumab. And there's nothing for, in fact, I know, you know, if you want to give a high risk infection patient, it's a patient uh, on chemotherapy with malignancy. So uh, what's your take on the on that study that did show a slight increased risk of infections? Uh, I think it was pneumonia. No, 
Yeah, and unit tract infections, if I yeah, no, that was and you can see and right. see yeah. Yeah, uh, opportunistic yeah. infections. No, I mean, there is, of course, I mean, it's osteoimmunology is something which is hot, so that there could be some kind of connection between infections and, and, and bone, but, but uh, at least for me also, it was not, let's say, convincing data that we should be very careful. I mean, it's, of course, something we should keep an eye on, to say yeah. so, but not something that's keep me off the drug, no. Great. Thank you. Another question by Dr. Kokjan from Andenosumab is asking what uh, to use post denosumab in patients uh, with CKD4 on 5. That's an excellent <laughs> question. <laughs> okay. Let's go uh, back to basic CKD MD management. Because yeah, once they. I mean, if, yeah, let's go ahead, Kasim. You know, sure, because if you're stopping the denosumab because their kidney function is so bad, uh, that means obviously there it's also really bad for the bisphosphonates uh, and a we don't know what dose of bisphosphonate you need to give after the loss of mab uh, so we don't know when to give it or how often <laughs> and uh, so often what i would do is if a patient really is uh, not wanting to continue with the risk of of the loss of mab you've discussed the risks of off treatment and rebound i, I just focus on optimizing the ckmd and, and one point i did learn from peter's talk was the role of measuring serum bicarbonate, which isn't that common in our bone field from what I can understand. And that was something I, I, I thought was different and would change my practice. Mm -hmm. it's, it's easy, it's cheap, and it's uh, certainly, it's uh, uh, at least there is not that big studies in, in clinical, uh, in humans, but, but animal data are rather convincing that it certainly can be of help to protect the bone, yeah. Thank you. Uh, another question uh, by Dr. Lindsay now on uh, allandronic acid. In practice, at what EGFR level are you using allandronic acid down to? Any experience with alternate weak administration? Yeah, that's the same question we already had a little bit on the dose and the dosing of, of bisphosphonates. Um, um, so as I said, we don't. I, at least I don't have any rationale to do so. I mean, there is okay, there is some theoretical background that could support you in doing so. But but at the end, I mean, that this is I mean this is really weak, and and so I don't I don't uh, change my dose of of these phosphonates. Um, uh, as I said, I'm always. Um, Balancing uh, risks and benefits of, of bisphosphonates in advanced CKD and, and uh, I mean, making choices with, with bisphosphonates and, and, and denosumab. Um, also, the reimbursement, of course, is, 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 a, is an issue. I mean, in, in Belgium, uh, it's only since, since brief, since a short time, we have denosumab available in, in, in male patients. So before it was only in females we could prescribe it. Uh, so that, that all makes makes me makes i will will define the, the the final choice in your patient but i i um i mean if if really there is a a good indication to go for for bisphosphonates i i would do it even in patients with advanced ckd but as as um as already said in the beginning of this talk this is all uh, opinion and and please keep this in in, in mind this is opinion of a person who is interested in bone but um, I mean, I cannot say that this is supported by, by hard evidence again, because this evidence is just lacking. And I don't believe it will ever come. So if you just say, okay, let's wait for, for two years. No, in two years, it will just be the same. Wait for five years, there will be no studies. They're all off patent and, and no one is interested in, in doing this kind of studies, except uh, it's supported by uh, governmental uh, grants, for example. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Tabassum is asking uh, what you do with uh, patients with uh, cancer, prostate, and uh, bone metastasis and CKD stage 4. Is uh, DEXA scan re reliable in this case with bone metastasis? And uh, which dose of denosumab um, is recommended in the presence of bone metastasis? I would ask the oncologist. <laughs> I, would ask the oncologist. I, would, I would ask Kasim. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we don't. If someone's got bone mets, they have an indication for high dose anti resorptive. So they're excluded from the osteoporosis pathway because they'll get high dose. And their prognosis with bone metastasis is completely different with osteoporosis. 
so you're not looking at long-term therapy. Um, so that's a good question. I think before we go, because I know time's over, I just wanted to just dissect with Peter this bone biopsy and whether you need histomorphometry or whether you just need a good histologist who can show you that there are there is active anti there's active osteoclastic activity, the osteoids mineralized. Um, uh, you know, how big that's is the osteoids? An that's an excellent point, uh, Kasim. I mean, I, I can just tell you that following this this consensus paper in, in osteoporosis, we're now are building a consensus on bone histomorphology, what we need and, and what the, the, let's see, the limited data we need at the end to make a clinical decision. And you're right, in a sense, all the, I mean, the, the full um, um, uh, histomorphology data set, which is, which is really a very extensive, is probably not always needed. I mean, if you have a good pathologist who is able to make a distinction between um, uh, high versus low bone turnover, at the same time also can inform you on whether this is low or uh, normal mineralization, that's it. I mean, we, we, we speak nowadays in what we call TMV classification. So turnover, mineralization, and volume. Volume, I don't believe really bone bags is, is giving you good insight and you should use DEXA, which is much more giving you an, an overview of the whole skeleton. But for mineralization and, and, and turnover, a bone biopsy can be of help. And you don't need to full uh, uh, histomorphotry. You can only ask him to give you, let's say, coding the turnover as being normal, high or low, and also yeah. coding the mineralization as being low, normal, um, of, or, or abnormal. That, so that, that should be sufficient, yeah. And one more, and Dominic, I know we've got loads of other questions, but one more thing I really wanted to highlight with Peter is that, you know, in that second patient, Mary, it was actually her vertebral fractures that completely changed her refracture risk. And I think mm -hmm. Peter raised a really important point about the role of VFA, probably more important than DEXA in some patients with CKDMD with fractures, even if they've had a fracture maybe of the wrist, doing some sort of vertebral assessment. And, and you know, a Professor William Lems from um, Netherlands has just published a, a nice review on VFA in the FLS setting. So, you know, I think it really is important that we think of VFA and DEXA together. Uh, if I yeah. had my push, I'd do a VFA first. And that's certainly something that needs to be, I mean, that needs to be supported. But because nowadays, I mean, it's it's DEXA and it's it's only a DEXA of the of the femur or from the hip and the lumbar spine, that's it. So, um, I mean, it's only limited effort to, to also get the, the VFA uh, in addition, yeah. Okay. Sorry, well, yeah. I think it's time to conclude. And uh, I'm sorry, we don't have time to answer all the questions, but we already spent, uh, you know, some time with the uh, Q&A. And uh, I would like to thank you for your participation in this webinar. And we hope that you enjoyed this session. We will post the recording of the webinar on the IOF website, and you will also receive tomorrow the link uh, to the recording and the PDF of the paper by email. Um, you will be prompt to fill in a survey immediately after this webinar, as we would appreciate your input and comments as we continuously try to deliver webinars that meet your needs. And uh, last but not the least, if you have any questions, comments, please do not hesitate to send them over to webinar at iofbonehealth.org. And um, I would like to warmly thank uh, Professor Evenepoel and Professor Javed for their outstanding presentations and for the very good Q&A sessions. And uh, I would like to wish everybody a nice day or a good evening. Goodbye to everyone. and. Uh, See you at the next uh, webinar. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you, Iris. Dominique, should we stay on? <laughs>